My friends, uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, we just celebrated, are a corrective to the despair and suffering that pervades so many hearts in the world today. Another corrective is the writing of novelist, scientist, and poet, Alan Lightman. Alan is a child of Temple Israel, a member of this congregation for life, but this is his first trip home to Temple as a grandfather to Ada, along with Ada's beautiful grandmother, Jean, and the Lightman Tashi entourage. It is uncanny to me how the mission of Temple encapsulates who Alan is. In case you didn't know our mission, Temple Israel is a sanctuary for prayer and inspiration. And no writer inspires more than Alan Lightman. Temple Israel is a vibrant center for Jewish learning. And no teacher generates deeper Jewish questions than the one here tonight who wrote Mr. G, G being God. Temple is a source of strength and a force for good for reformed Jews, the greater community, and the world. And thanks to Alan, we are intertwined not only with the greater community of faith in Memphis, but also with the work of Harpswell, Alan's brainchild, which in a brief time is already transforming Cambodia and the developing world with brilliant and inspired young women, two of whom are in Memphis this entire year attending Rhodes College. Finally, Temple is a congregational home for living Torah, which gives me chills. It gave me chills when I asked Alan many moons ago to return home on this major Sabbath of the year between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It gave me chills because of the synchronicity between this week's Torah portion and Alan Lightman. This week's Torah portion is the shortest in all of Scripture, just one chapter, Deuteronomy 32. It's actually a poem. It's like the only book of Alan's I hadn't read until he gave it to me a few weeks ago, Song of Two Worlds, which is also one long poem about a poet who awakens one morning from a long, dark night trying to find something to believe in. So the guy turns to science, religion, philosophy, basically embarks on the inner pilgrimage everyone in this chapel is supposed to embark on during these three weeks, which started with Rosh Hashanah and end with Genesis on Simchat Torah. Like the Torah, I had to read Alan's poem over and over again to appreciate how he weaves, as the Torah does, images as ancient as the Jewish people and the scrolls you're facing in the ark. But Moses this week ends his poetry and last lecture with a wish. May my discourse come down as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like showers on young growth, like droplets on the grass. Alan does something even more Jewish. He answers questions with even more questions. I quote from his book, Song of Two Worlds. Were you stunned, the poet asks in Alan's book, when you found that the hardness of time was illusion? What is the nature of movement? I am answered, says Alan's character. What is the nature of movement? You return to the center. And that, my friends, is the designated name for this Sabbath. It's called the Sabbath of returning to the center. The Sabbath of return, Shabbat Shuvah. My chills turn to tears when I turn from his book back to the Torah's poem this week, which reads, Sha'ala vicha v'yagedcha z'keinecha v'yomu lach, which means, ask your father, the Torah says, and your father will explain to you. Ask your elders, and they will tell you. This verse stresses the importance of continuity in family and history. And Alan and the generations after him are here thanks to his father and mother of blessed memory. And linking my own personal and professional life in one sentence, 
I'm also here in Memphis in part because of elders like his father and Aunt Jean Mimi, both of whom I truly loved and used to visit, not because it was my job, but to feed my own soul. When Alan's dad, Richard Lightman, passed away, Alan was with the young women at Harpswell on the very day that I was to fly from Memphis to Cambodia with the Boyds and others. I did not want to leave Memphis, not out of obligation, but out of love. Alan trekked back from Phnom Penh. I waited in the den where his father used to sit and read, not in his chair. I heard the door open. And one, in one of those moments we've all experienced, when no words are necessary, I hugged Alan as he ran inside 226 West Cherry Circle after 24 hours of nonstop travel. And only then did I feel OK about heading to Phnom Penh with the Memphis group to meet Gene and say Kaddish for Dick Lightman in the place where Alan made his father and the Lightman Tashi family so proud. I was scheduled to lead tonight's service alone, but I wanted to give the one who has been dubbed Temple Israel Sunshine, Rabbi Katie Bowman. I wanted her to be alongside me tonight. Rabbi Katie's deep spirituality explains why the Lightman Tashi family found comfort in her and why we're all so blessed to have Katie's light shine on us. But while Katie is more like a sister to me, and Alan is truly my brother, I don't believe in nepotism. So let me close by saying this. For me, quality and impact have to be the standard for spirituality, for a culture of excellence, especially for a congregation of such important consequence for the future of Jewish life in the Deep South. I don't even have to get personal when you have the highest quality in our speaker and in Rabbi Katie. Shaping Jewish, Christian, and Buddhist lives, I'm not making this up, from the mezuzahs on the temple doorway behind you to the doorway of the Harpswell Leadership Center in Phnom Penh, which has our mezuzahs there. But I still wish to close this part by saying something very personal that my Temple family may, may not know, but which my wife, Cheryl, and my children, Kara, Jake, and Julia, are all keenly aware. My deep friendship and ongoing partnership with Alan has truly been one of the bright lights of my life. The name of this week's Torah portion, Ha'azinu, it means give ear, as in y'all listen. So let's listen. He's here, uh, thanks to the Rabbi James A. Wax Fund, his confirmation teacher, Rabbi Wax. But let's listen to one of my rabbis and a child of Memphis and Temple Israel, Alan Lightman. Is that better? Yeah, okay, right. Down. Oh, you want me to use the... Okay. Um, well, it's, it's wonderful to, just, to see so many old friends here tonight. And uh, as Rabbi Micah said a couple of nights ago, I hope that we are all growing old instead of becoming old is a, a big difference. It's, it's a, an honor for me to, to speak here at Temple Israel, uh, where I was in Rabbi Wax's confirmation class of 1964. And it's also an honor to have been invited by uh, Rabbi Greenstein. Micah Greenstein is uh, a treasure for Temple Israel and a treasure for all of Memphis. And I know that all of you know that. 
I'm going to read a, a few pages from my latest novel, Mr. G, which is the story of creation as told by God. Uh, very presumptuous to have written such a book. Uh, of course, every religion and every human culture has had its story of creation, and science has had its own account of creation, which is called the Big Bang Model, much of which has been confirmed by the methods of science. But science cannot say anything about what lies outside of the physical universe. And in my novel, Mr. G, uh, I wanted to combine the scientific story of creation with a theological story of creation and have a little fun at the same time. So I'm going to read you uh, a few pages from the book. And I'm going to start uh, at the very beginning. Uh, the first chapter is called Time. Remember, I had woken up from a nap when I decided to create. As I remember, I had just woken up from a nap when I decided to create the universe. Not much was happening at that time. As a matter of fact, time didn't exist, nor space. When you looked out into the void, you were really looking at nothing more than your own thought. And if you tried to picture wind or stars or water, you couldn't give form or texture to your notions. Those things did not exist. Smooth, rough, waxy, sharp, prickly, brittle, even qualities such as these lack meaning. Practically everything slept in an infinite torpor of potentiality. I knew that I could make whatever I wanted, but that was the problem. Unlimited possibilities bring unlimited indecision. When I thought about this particular creation or that, uncertain about how each thing would turn out, I grew anxious and went back to sleep. But at a particular moment, I managed, if, if not exactly to sweep aside my doubts, at least to take a chance. Almost immediately, it seemed, my Aunt Penelope asked me why I would want to do such a thing. Wasn't I comfortable with the emptiness just as it was? Yes, yes, I said, of course. But you could mess things up, said my aunt. Leave him alone, said Uncle Deva. Uncle toddled over and stood beside me in his dear way. Please don't tell me what to do, retorted my aunt. Then she turned and stared hard at me. Her hair, uncombed and knotted as usual, drooped down to her bulky shoulders. Well, she said and waited. I never liked it when Aunt Penelope glowered at me. I think I'm going to do it, I finally said. It was the first decision I'd made in eons of unmeasured existence and it felt good to have decided something. In fact, I had just created time, but unintentionally. It was just that my resolution to act, to make things, to put an end to the unceasing absence of happenings required time. By deciding to create something, I had pressed an arrow into the shapeless and unending void an arrow that pointed in the direction of the future. Henceforth, there would be a before and an after, a continuing stream of successive events. Time necessarily came before light and dark, matter and energy, even space. Time was my first creation. See, my aunt complained when it became apparent that we were now conscious of time. I told you that you'd mess things up. She shot Uncle a look of disapproval as if he had encouraged me to act as I had. And then she began an unhappy summary of the various things that she had done and not done during the immediate past, then during the past before that, and so on, back and back through the now visible chasms of time. 
until finally uncle begged her to stop. You should never have created the past and the future, she said. We were happy here. We were, you see, now I must say were, when before, oh, there it goes again. It was so much nicer when everything happened at once. I can't stand to think about the future. But don't you think we have some responsibility to the future, I suggested, to all the things and beings I might create? Nonsense, shrieked Aunt Penelope. What a foolish argument. You have no responsibility to things that don't yet exist and won't ever exist if you could just keep your big thoughts to yourself. But it's too late now, she went on. I can feel time. I can feel the future. She had gotten herself into one of her states, and the void twisted and throbbed with her displeasure. Gently, Uncle caressed her. For the first time ever, she responded to his touch. Her ranting diminished. Soon after, she realized that her hair needed combing, and that was the beginning of something, and probably all for the best. Space. I had in mind a number of things I wanted to make, but with no previous experience with materiality, I could think of these things only in terms of their functions or qualities. My ideas for both animate and inanimate invention required material existence, extension, volume, and for that I needed to create space. Space didn't appear all at once, but in a languorous progression, gradually increasing in length, width, and breadth. I had toyed with various numbers of, of dimensions. Two seemed unnecessarily confining, in fact, suffocating, while four or more struck me as extravagant and ran the risk of misplacing small objects. I decided my first try would be three. As I recall, space first appeared in a minuscule round bubble that sat quietly in my mind. Then it stretched slightly in length, humming at a high pitch as it did so. For a time, the universe was a tiny ellipsoid. Slowly, breadth and width began to catch up with link, with length making an impatient clucking sound. Sphericity was restored. And then with a sigh and a low rumble, all three dimensions began to unravel at once, tumbling and sprawling into the void. My universe had come into being. It was tiny at first, but beautiful, a lovely little sphere. Its surfaces were smooth and silky, yet infinitely strong. It glistened. It spun slightly. It vibrated with energy. The energy howled and struggled to break out of those smooth, silky walls, but it couldn't because those walls contained all that there was, except for me, Aunt Penelope, and Uncle Deva. As the combat ensued, the tiny sphere that was the universe began inflating at an enormous speed. Aunt Penelope, who in a rare moment had been quietly brushing her air, hair, was knocked over by the expanding sphere. Save me, she screamed to Uncle Deva, over-dramatizing the situation as she often did. Uncle helped write her and studied her. What was that thing, she shouted. The impertinence. Then, without thanking Uncle, she stomped off into the void, even though she had disappeared behind the folds and the pleats of the vacuum. I could hear my aunt muttering, what's he done now? There's no end to this, no end, no end to this, no end, no end. What's he done now? There's no end to this. Meanwhile, my universe was growing larger and larger. Once created, it seemed determined to become as fat as it could. I decided to make another. This one I slightly pricked at the moment it came into existence, just the smallest of flicks to, sleep, to see what a slight alteration would bring. 
the little sphere began expanding like the previous universe, but after a few moments, its expansion, expansion coasted to a halt. It briefly hovered in a fleeting equilibrium, then it began contracting and dwindling in size, getting smaller and smaller until it was just the tiniest dot, and then, with a faint pop, it disappeared. I was delighted. I made other universes. With each one, I tried a different variation. To some, I gave a slight lateral nudge. To others, a bit of extra spin. Some, I squeezed just at the moment of creation to add a smidgen of energy. After a time, a gigantic number of universes were flying about, spinning on their axes, throbbing and pulsing, expanding and contracting at fantastic speed. My aunt was nowhere to be seen. Uncle Deva, as sympathetic as he was to my enterprise, had ducked for cover. By and by, Aunt Penelope emerged from her hiding place, Uncle Deva from his. You've been busy, said Uncle, looking with mild annoyance at the many universes flying about. If I were you, I wouldn't get attached to any of them. You'll just be disappointed. I took Uncle's comment under advisement. Already, I was rather fine, fond of some of the expanding universes. What's in those things, anyway? asked Aunt Penelope. Space, I answered. Hum, she said. Well, now that we have space, I'd like, please, a chair to sit down in. I've been standing for a very long time. So I made a chair for Aunt Penelope. That, that chair was my very first creation of matter. It had three curved legs and an octagonal back, and I designed it to be comfortable, but not too comfortable. My aunt sat down in it without comment. Far more awaited, I wanted to make more matter. I wanted to make galaxies and stars. I wanted to make planets. I wanted to make living creatures and minds. But for the moment, I sat and I meditated and I gazed with contentment at the empty but vibrating universes I'd made. Two more little chapters. Some organizational principles. May I give you some advice, nephew, said Aunt Penelope. The three of us had been wandering about in the void for some time, talking about how our existence had changed. Don't give him advice, said Uncle. He doesn't need our advice. Hush, said Aunt Penelope. I'm entitled to give nephew my advice to my nephew. Aunt Penelope took me aside, leaving Uncle by himself. Now, I wanted you to listen to me, she said. This is no criticism. Your uncle and I have always been impressed with you, but we are your elders, and we do notice what goes on around here. You shouldn't do things with such haste. You rush into things. Slow down. Take your time with this project. I hadn't been aware I was rushing, I said to my aunt. All these things flying about Sh shouted Aunt. You made them so quickly. Why don't you just concentrate on one of your universes and see if you can do a good job with it? That's excellent advice, said Uncle Deva, standing some distance away. Which one would you like? I asked my aunt. It was not a serious question. There were billions of spheres and hyperboloids flying about, by now having inflated to a billion times larger than they were just a few moments ago. This one, said my aunt, and she suddenly reached up and caught one of the spheres flying past. Work on this one. We have confidence in you, your uncle and I, and we're certain that you can do well with it. Now that you've started this project, just take your time. That's all I'm suggesting. Now Mr. G creates stars galaxies and planets. Among all the atoms, carbon was supreme at bonding with other atoms. It had just the right number of electrons. 
As a result, carbon atoms could gather up hundreds of atoms of oxygen, hydrogen, and other elements in long gangly chains, or instead form rings and other elaborate structures. As with the planets and stars, I had nothing to do with the manufacture of these molecules. They form by themselves, irresistibly following the creation of matter and the small number of principles I had laid down for the universe. Cause and effect, cause and effect. I was a mere spectator. As soon as large molecules were formed in the planetary atmospheres, they plummeted down through the air and sank into the oceans. In time, the oceans of quite a few planets became a thick hodgepodge of carbon-based molecules, water, and fragments of other molecules. These bits and pieces proceeded to collide with each other at great frequency as they moved about and jostled in the warm seas. There were trillions upon trillions of such molecular collisions. With so many encounters, all kinds of new things occurred. New molecules were created. Some molecules stuck together to form bigger molecules. Some were rearranged or tore off pieces of each other. Various architectural structures formed. It was trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. It was trillions of scientific experiments performed every moment. And now I'm skipping over a lot of chapters of the book. Many eons pass billions of years. Intelligent creatures arise. They build uh, cities. They build civilizations. And mean they have various ethical and moral dilemmas. And meanwhile, Mr. G, Aunt Penelope, and Uncle Deva are making a number of trips into the new universe. So the last section I'm going to read is called Address for Aunt Penelope. There were many things that we in the void picked up from the new universe. Birthdays, for example. We thought birthdays were delightful. Aunt P and Uncle D began planning birthday parties for themselves, although choosing a date and an interval of time between birthdays was a bit problematic. Following one of our excursions into the new universe and back, Aunt P suddenly announced that she was having a birthday party after her next sleep and she expected presents. And I don't want any items from the void, she said, made out of nothingness. I've already got plenty of nothing. I want something material. Do you understand what I'm saying? A birthday party is a splendid idea, idea said Uncle D. But about the presents, I don't know. No buts, said Aunt P. I'm going for my beauty rest now. And when I wake up, I want presents lots of them. You've got a whole universe full of stuff to choose from. And I want something pink. And with that, Aunt P yawned and retired. A difficult spouse, Uncle whispered to me in exasperation, but what can you do? So Uncle and I went into the universe and found a newly forming galaxy full of pink stars, and we carried it back to the void. In the void, the material was nearly weightless. It shimmered and glowed. You could almost see through it. With a few folds, with a few folds and tucks, we made a beautiful dress for Aunt Penelope, as she'd always wanted. Uncle named the dress Kalyana. He said nothing about the mismatch of essences between the void and the material universe, as he had in mind a, a few material things he wanted for his birthday, which he informed me was coming up quite soon. Oh my, Aunt P exclaimed when she woke up and saw the dress draped over an outcropping of the void. It's lovely. You shouldn't have gone to the trouble. Immediately, she put on the garment. Then she studied herself for a few moments. 
she turned this way and that, exclaimed again, and began dancing about and singing at the same time. Although there were many pink stars, there were also blue ones and yellow ones and green ones. It was a dress of many colors. Wearing it, Aunt Penelope was the most beautiful thing in the void. Every time she twirled, a few stars came loose and began sailing off, and Uncle would shuffle over and scoop them up and stick them back on. For eons, Aunt P never took that dress off, even for sleeping. It lasted for a billion, trillion, trillion atomic ticks. After that, most of the stars had exploded or burned out, and the garment lost its color and shape. Thank you.